Hello and welcome to another video on basic fiber optics. Today we'll explore a bit about how two different laser beams can interfere with each other. So let's imagine we have an optical fiber where two different um, frequencies of light are present. So we have to imagine essentially two monochromatic lasers inside of the same fiber being sent onto a photodiode, being connected to an oscilloscope which then grabs the measured voltage over time. What's exactly going to happen? Well, here at the location of the photodiode, we're going to have a total electric field consisting of E1 with its complex exponential showing how the, um, the phase of the electric field changes over time, plus E2 with its own um, exponential term right here. So let us try to simplify this a little bit by factoring out e to the i omega 2 t over 2 as well as e to the i omega 1 t over 2 outside here. So if we do that, we, um, we have this outside exponential term here, the average uh, frequency, as well as two terms in here corresponding to the, um, essentially the frequency difference. Then, if we compute the absolute square of that signal, which should be proportional to the voltage we get over here on the oscilloscope, we get the following expression containing cosine squared. Now just ignore this little blurb here, that's just me making a typo. So essentially if we rewrite this expression for cosine squared, we get the following. So there's going to be some kind of constant offset as we can see, as well as a cosine term that oscillates at the frequency difference. So in other words, if we observe a certain um, oscillation frequency at this trace over here, then we know exactly how far away the optical frequencies of these two lasers are from each other. So let's take a look at that. Okay, just very briefly, this is essentially the setup we're going to be looking at. It's a situation where we have two lasers uh, plugged into each of their respective ports of a 50-50 coupler. And these are then has the, or this one then has the um, common port connected to a photodiode, which is then connected to an oscilloscope. Now, I've chosen to use a 40 gigahertz bandwidth photodiode here, because this um, makes it a bit easier to see when the, um, when the two lasers are close to each other. Remember that the uh, bandwidth of a photodiode is essentially the largest frequency I can sort of reliably detect, which means that if I'd use the 350 megahertz diode we've used so far, then these two lasers have to be very close in frequency space before we can even see anything going on. But this one gives us a little bit more, um, more of a window where we can actually measure the, the frequency difference. All right, let's see how this looks. Okay, here we see the oscilloscope trace that we get from two lasers hitting the photodiode. At the moment, I'm just using a DFB laser, which we've discussed in a previous video, along with the, um, the laser that we used for the EUM video and the OTDR video. But this time we're not pulsing it, we're just letting it be a continuous wave laser hitting the, the photodiode. So at the moment we're not really seeing very much, and essentially the reason is that the frequency separation between the two lasers is too large for the photodiode to reliably detect. So I'm going to change the carrier frequency of the DFB laser by adjusting the current supplied a little bit. And as you'll remember from a previous video, by changing the current, we are changing the refractive index, the gain medium, which changes the output frequency. So as you can see here, we actually have a sort of a cosine wave going on in here. Let me maybe zoom into that a little bit more so it's more clear. And we should be able to, oh, what's going on here? I think we might be a bit too close now. It's now a bit further away, so now they're not possible to detect. We're moving closer to the same frequency. Let's zoom in a bit more. I think it's actually because we're at too low of a frequency and the oscilloscope is sort of overlapping multiple traces here, but you can definitely see there's some kind of sinusoidal behavior going on. But in order to make it a little bit more clear, instead of using it the, the time domain, let's look at the frequency domain. So I'm going to adjust the camera here, go into, I think it's analyze, math, and then display this one, and select the FFT magnitude, like so. So let's see how that looks. Okay, very interesting. So we can see here that there's a large um, offset. Oh, let me zoom out a bit more. So oh, I might even want to reduce this a little bit. Okay, that's nice. I think we can see both things at the same time now. Good. Okay, so we're essentially seeing two spikes right here. The spike here at zero just indicates that we have a certain offset, which is what we saw in the calculation. That's like one plus a cosine term. And here we see the frequency of that oscillation. So I'm wondering if you can get a marker to maybe determine where that peak is. Is there a smart way to do this? Sorry, bear with me, I haven't used the oscilloscope here in a while. 
So manual placement, can we select function number one? Yes, function number one here, that's good. Okay, so let's take this marker and place it right here. So this one is indicating that we're at 12 gigahertz. So let me try to change the wavelength a bit more. As you can see now I'm changing the wavelength of the laser by tuning its current. And you can see that both the um, oscilloscope trace up here has like slow oscillations and also the, the corresponding frequency that's calculated from this shifts towards the left towards smaller frequencies. Now you can really see how broad it's starting to get. We have really slow oscillations because the lasers are quite close to each other. And now they're actually almost identical. Like so, and now keep keep turning it the same way actually and we see that this um, frequency line is now starting to shift to the right again. So remember what happens here is that the because we have a cosine function it's sort of it's sort of even so it doesn't really distinguish between having omega 2 minus omega 1 or omega 1 minus omega 2. So it can really tell if one frequency is higher than the other one. All right very cool. So one thing we can think about is what determines the, um, the sort of the width of this line right here. Now essentially if we had um, say a perfect oscilloscope that could have an infinitely fast sampling rate and a perfect photodiode, then we'd even still have a little bit of width to this peak here. And the reason is that uh, even though the lasers are very, very interesting, very, very cool, they're not perfectly stable oscillators. It means that if they emit a certain frequency, let's say 200 terahertz or something, then that frequency line is always going to shift back and forth a little bit. It's going to be a little bit of um, a phase error in the, um, in, the, in the oscillator, which means that this spike rate here gets smeared out a little bit. In fact, the smearing we are observing right here again, assuming that we had a perfect oscilloscope and perfect photodiode, would simply be a combination of the sort of smearing from both of the two lasers, like shaking back and forth in the frequency domain. All right, so I hope that's a nice little introduction to observing the interference of two lasers. Stay tuned for more videos.